So hi, a nice evening. Uh, welcome to the last videogram of the semester today with the platform AQMB. AQMB is a non-profit editorial platform working at the intersection of visual art, music, critical thinking to cover the contemporary and experimental field of today's creational and artistic practice and theory. Uh, this is implemented through publishing interviews, podcasts, reviews and theoretical writings as well as offering their platform for emerging artists and theorists. AQMB is currently working on a 10 years anthology while migrating away from the commercial platforms onto Discord. We will discuss this, but also the changing landscape of independent publishing today with the associate editor of AQMB, Jared Davis. Jared, welcome. Uh, Jared is a writer and creator based in London. In addition to the editorial work within AQMB, he runs the podcast series Artist Statements, available on SoundCloud. Artist Statements is a conversational series that features artists and thinkers from around the globe and it's uh, publishing chats that are focused on the visual arts, music, critical thinking, technology and beyond. Uh, Jared created events such as Panorama uh, Storytelling, which focus on the digital age's occult surgeons and neo-gothic tendencies, as well as our fears of the unknown and its relation to technology or uh, even hyperobjectivity that explore the ungraspable concern about climate change. And hereby, I would like to leave the floor to our guest, Jared. Uh, hello, and thank you one more time for being us here Hi. today. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, do you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you well. Yes, okay, great. Yeah, cool. Um, excellent. Uh, thanks very much again, Jan, for having me to chat today about AQMB and various topics, um, as, as you introduced so nicely. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, I guess, for about an hour or so. Uh, I, I've got uh, a, a few notes, and I kind of want to take this a little bit um, conversationally, I guess, as well. So if there are any questions, feel free to ask. It's not going to be so much as, I, I don't want it to be so much of a straight lecture. I want to kind of improvise it a bit and make it a little bit less boring. Um, but yeah, as, as Jan, I guess Jan gave a bit of an introduction already to AQMB, but um, for anyone unfamiliar, I'll just sort of briefly um, overview, uh, give a bit of an overview of what we do. Um, as, as, as Jan mentioned, we're a not-for-profit editorial platform. Um, basically, uh, sort of uh, began as a bit of a, an online magazine, I guess, and we work across primarily visual art and music uh, and critical thinking. We publish um, essays and, and think pieces, and uh, yeah, that are sort of the, the topics of what we span, we publish reviews, we publish feature articles, we do um, exhibition documentation posts, um, and a big part of our website as well is uh, sound um, premieres of new music. And lately, just in the last couple of years, we've gotten into producing podcasts um, and also compendiums of um, or, or compilations, rather, it might be more more uh, easy to remember word um, of um, new music and uh, visual art commissions. So yeah, we span a, a whole whole broad lot, but essentially we are um, sort of our sort of bread and butter is the website aqmb.com and we have um, various other social platforms and we've got a Patreon as well for subscribers, which are our exclusive content like the podcasts um, run off of. And as Jan mentioned as well, we're kind of moving into having a discord as well for exclusive for our patreon subscribers so it's a bit of a web um and i'm going to go a little bit more into kind of how this is relevant because what i really want to talk about about today is about kind of a brief bit of the history of aqmb and kind of um sort of how how it started and how it started and how it's going um so sort of we've been running in this current form for about 10 years now and over that time there's been a lot of change obviously in um uh, social media and in uh, the way that an independent publication might run. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the themes a little bit. Um, I want to talk about AQMB as a bit of a context as well for maybe giving you guys some, uh, I guess, sort of uh, theoretical, like maybe media, I want to have, have a bit of like a media theory framing to some of this thinking to sort of apply it a bit more broadly to um, just independent publishing in general in the digital age and social media and how it's kind of uh, sort of disrupted that. Uh, so yeah, just a little bit, of, a brief a bit about the history. I'll also say as well, I've been involved in AQMB as associate editors um, since 2018. 
um, but the platform has been running in its current form since 2012. Uh, I would say that myself as a reader of AQMB, I've probably been following it quite closely since around 2014. So one thing about AQMB is I guess it's it's because it's got this long history. It's probably a bunch of various different things to various different people. Uh, and so my kind of opinions and, and my discussions on uh, the earlier parts of AQMB's life are also kind of my uh, external perspective at the time, looking into AQMB as a fan a little bit. Um, so yeah, but people might have other different ideas, particularly people that have been following it in more recent years, I suppose. So uh, yeah, so going back to the start, uh, it began as a, a, a speculative blog project, really. Um, it was started by someone under the alias, um, Don Tercio, who, uh, and at the beginning of AQMB, everyone was working under aliases. Uh, and Don Tercio invited uh, Steph Kredovitz, um, who was working at that time and still uh, currently, uh, occasionally using the um, uh, the alias uh, Jean K or Jean K. Uh, first, um, Steph came on as as a writer and then as editor, and you know from around 2012 has, has sort of I guess founded AQMB into the form that it's it's become and what we know it as today. Um, so yeah, uh, as yeah as I mentioned, then some years later I joined. Uh, yeah, so at its core, I mean. As I mentioned, I gave a bit of an overview of some of the things that we publish, but and I guess there's a certain aesthetic um, that all of these things kind of cover. But maybe if if it could, if there's just like one kind of through line through all of it, I guess it's it's art and music's relationship with digital culture, um, internet culture, and digital culture play very strongly into the aesthetics, but also into the discussions that a lot of the work over the ten year period of AQMB has been focused on. Um, so yeah, that's kind of important thing that I want to kind of frame this this chat a little bit on about. Um, yeah, and so uh, I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about uh, some of the earlier years of AQMB and maybe sort of just give a bit of a, a a bit of a picture of the sort of art and music landscape at that time in the early 2010s um, and early to mid 2010s, uh, and I guess. What you could say is, if you look at some of the early features on the site, um, uh, a big, uh, a, a big sort of uh, feature of the content was what would uh, a sort of a contested term, but things that could sort of fall into the the sort of ideas and discourses around the notion of post-internet art. Um, this is not something. You know, this term, as I uh, as I'm going to sort of talk about, is, is like quite a contested term and a lot of artists don't want to be labeled with this term. It also has sort of different threads, um, but uh, I would say that uh, what, what I kind of want to use this sort of term in thinking about is, um, if we could say what, what is post-internet art, it was a, a, a term that was used to sort of discuss art and music uh, that, uh, that's uh, sort of discussing the way in which internet has, uh, the internet has played a, a role in affecting art and music as well as general popular culture. And so uh, really with what AQMB uh, is, is sort of grounded around, um, the sort of through line through all of this, why I don't want to sort of talk about post AQMB, like sort of put it up on a pedestal as like a, a sort of um, uh, like a, uh, a sort of poster child for post internet, because it is such a contested term. But the through line that I'm really interested in here is um, sort of how digital culture and technology has affected aesthetics as one kind of point. Uh, and also from a kind of media theory standpoint is what are the characteristics of digital distribution and, you know, in itself and, and what are some of the effects of, of it on content and culture. So in the early 2010s and early to mid 2010s, uh, you know, AQMB was kind of publishing a lot of the practices that would kind of fall in the visual art world around this sort of ideas of post internet. Um, there was also, of course, um, quite prominent other publications such as uh, Disc Magazine, very important, and probably the sort of uh, um, uh, post-internet publication uh, and also an art collective um, that no longer exists in a magazine format but still work as this. Uh, and Rhizome, um, still going today, uh, also based in New York, uh, a digital art um, sort of uh, editorial platform, uh, posting a lot of these practices. Uh, I'm going to give you a bit of a, an overview now on, on sort of some of what I'm talking about. But again, as I say, I'm kind of 
uh, keeping this broad a little bit uh, with, with regards to my use of the term post-internet. So, I mean, in terms of visual art practices, artists like um, Kai Altman yeah, can be featured a bit on the, on the site in the earlier days of AQMB. Um, Timur Sukun, uh, Timur Sukin, sorry. And in the music side, and I should say why I'm sort of, I keep sort of diving away from wanting to talk about post-internet visual art is I'm actually going to ground this talk a little bit more on music. Um, and in the music side, I guess uh, of this time, uh, some of the labels like Fade to Mind uh, and Night Slugs, um, artists like uh, Nguzu Nguzu, uh, who I guess, you know, uh, came to be labeled under a sort of a term, deconstructed club music. Um, these were some of the practices that AQMB was publishing about quite a bit, and they could also be sort of seen to fall in this sort of um, world um, of post-internet art uh, and music, sometimes in terms like, um, and this is something that I'm going to discuss a little bit, but actually kind of kind of working together as a little bit of a scene, some of these people that I've mentioned. Um, uh, Fatima El-Kadiri. Uh, and also uh, in the UK side of things, um, the PC music scene as well kind of emerged around 2013, 2014, and AQMB was covering that a little bit. Again, uh, not strictly like post-internet art, but kind of related to these sort of discourses of how is um, digital culture affecting aesthetics and also how is how, what is digital distribution and you know how is the nature of digital distribution sort of affecting um, art and culture. And yeah, so one sort of characteristic of uh, what, what could be called post-internet and this is one of the aspects of it that I, I'm kind of interested in about is sort of responding to a kind of flattening of the media scape in a way through the internet. Um, that's one of the effects of how digital distribution has, has um, had an influence in the way we sort of perceive culture. Um, so, you know, I guess back in the day, you would have broadcast culture through television or radio, um, which would sort of present you with your mass kind of mainstream entertainment. Um, you'd have to dig a little deeper for maybe going to a small record store to pick up a zine or something for the underground culture. But nowadays, you kind of you would have mainstream pop culture. You would have um, you know underground music cultures and visual art and fashion, all sort of um, uh, sort of sharing the same mediascape of the internet. Uh, and this is, I think, a big sort of factor in in some of the. The, the way in which these practices in, in the sort of 2010s started to come about. Um, yeah, the, the art world of the, the 2010s, uh, early to mid 2010s, sometimes really sort of bled outside of the art, uh, out of the sort of edges of, of visual arts practices and into the worlds of fashion and music and sort of all came together a little bit like that. Um, definitely the Berlin Biennale of 2016 that was curated by DIS. Uh, was probably like a bit of a, um, like, I guess like a watershed moment of this, this quote unquote movement. Uh, it's uh, sort of, uh, it was a, a kind of moment that sort of um, uh, got a little bit of sometimes, I mean, mixed reviews, some people enjoyed this Biennale, but there was this kind of interesting critical backlash to it, um, which is something that I want to discuss now in sort of in terms of my kind of why I'm interested in these sort of framings of how digital culture is affecting aesthetics and, 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 and sort of, you know, the relation to some of the practices that we've looked at at AQMB. Um, yeah, I guess this is, this, this, this magazine's aesthetics is very much inspired by sort of stock photography. And, um, and I should just say, um, just to my point earlier, where I was talking about these, um, the, the kind of the way in which different kind of practices um, outside of the art world kind of came together. I mean, this was this Biennale was a, a very good example of that. There was uh, like an anthem written by Alicia Crampton and Kalila. So the music kind of world coming in together with um, example like this with Telfar, uh, the fashion designer was involved in the Biennale. Um, all of these kind of uh, worlds outside of contemporary art per se kind of coming together. Um, yeah, as I say, this sort of aesthetics um, that you're seeing like here is very much inspired by like stock photography of the internet um, and it's a very sort of high sheen quite corporate looking um, and this sort of uh, I think just dis distressed 
people a little bit um, in some in some of the reviews you read as being a sort of like cold and uh, maybe uncritically adopting some of this corporate aesthetics. Um, and but I'm quite interested in this um, like visceral aversion that people tend to have towards sh shiny um, things that are uh, quite um, uh, maybe more associated with mainstream culture. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how it appears in, in underground music culture a little bit and this sort of generational clash that seemed to happen around the early 2010s and uh, early to mid 2010s with, with things like PC music. But yeah, in the context of um, uh, the Berlin Biennale, um, yeah, this sort of uh, uh, discomfort that people had with these aesthetics was maybe a bit of, felt like a bit of a turning point in terms of like um, just different ideas and in, in terms of uh, sort of uh, mainstream culture and, uh, you know, sort of uh, the, the sort of role in the mediascape of what contemporary art sort of plays. And I'm not going to really, as I said, I want to kind of move more into the music world in my discussions of this and, and in its relation to AQMB. But here are a few good post-internet resources, maybe if you, you want to talk about more this visual art side that very much did adopt this term post-internet. Um, there's Karanachi and Robin Peckham's um, art post-internet catalogue from a, a sort of survey show that happened in China in 2014, Omar Khalif's uh, uh, You Are Here, Art After the Internet, and David Jostlett, which is not actually about post-internet art per se, but it's quite an influ influential sort of um, sort of aesthetic theory at the time. Um, but yeah, I want to talk about music and I want to talk about um, some of the sort of musical subcultures that we've been involved with on AQMB. Uh, and I want to talk about, as I say, the how um, kind of uh, digital culture has affected aesthetics. But I also want to talk about distribution in relation to being like an independent publication and the nature of what being independent is and what independent publishing is. Um, you know, DIY practices, um, these sort of do-it-yourself practices and these sorts of things. Uh, and I want to talk about um, sort of the ways in which the internet has sort of disrupted uh, these different chains of communication, um, mainstream communication and um, big broadcast audiences to the sort of um, what it is to be underground now. And all of these kinds of things are kind of written quite interestingly um, by, and I should say, I'm kind of going to segue a little bit into some, some more theoretical tools before we sort of talk a little bit about the, the actual practices. But this, this stuff was written really interestingly about by a writer, Adam Harper, um, who's not actually published with AQMB, um, but uh, I, I believe Adam Harper was on a panel uh, for one of the 3HD festivals, Cream Cake, that we work with a bit with, with our editor, Steph Kredovitz, I think. Don't quote me on that a few years ago. Um, but yeah, this is a really great essay that's kind of looking at some of these tendencies and does discuss, um, you know, the sort of post-internet movement a little bit from a, a music perspective. Um, and it's on Resident Advisor from a few years ago. Uh, and I just kind of wanted to read a quote from it. Um, it's quite interesting. Uh, before I sort of talk more of it, I'll just read the quote. Um, so by the 1970s, he's talking about punk, actually. So I will just sort of uh, just quickly introduce this by saying that punk, we're probably all familiar with like punk rock music and, and the aesthetics of it. But what his sort of point of interest is here and the very important part of it is the fact that um, what punk was about when it sort of emerged in the 1970s was this sort of response to um, the the um, the lack of access to um, the the means of distribution of music? Um, you know, up until that time, uh, you know, if if you wanted to record some music, you needed access to a recording studio, which is uh, the music equipment technology was very expensive. The only people that had that access as recording studios to, to be able to access that expensive recording studio, you would likely need a record contract and to give you that access and that, that sort of capital behind you. And in order to have a record contract, of course, um, you know, you need to uh, be of the taste of the major record labels. So punk sort of emerged at this time when 
technology had actually allowed for um, an ease of participation. There was the um, you know, four track cassette recorders um, and these sorts of things that allow people to all of a sudden, hey, you can just form a band in your garage. Also punk really, um, and part, that's part of its aesthetics was uh, very much involved with um, an amateurism and sort of came to embrace that amateurism. You only need to know three guitar, three guitar chords. You don't necessarily have to play them particularly well, but it's fine. You can release it. You can release a cassette or there's cheaper pressing facilities now for seven inches, these sorts of things. So this is something that's sort of left out. We're not spoken about so much in the, when we talk about punk now that everyone just sort of talks about the aesthetics a little bit, but um, or just the sound of what it is to be punk. But it was very much about the way that technology enabled a, um, a sort of change in distribution. Um, and so that's where it becomes kind of interesting when you want to talk about um, some of these discussions we're having now about technology and communication and distribution with independent publications such as us. Um, yeah, something like this, this, this text by Adam Harper becomes really interesting and relevant. So I'll just read it. Um, by the 1970s, uh, what made punk particularly possible as a wave, a musical generation even, was the technology, technologically lowered threshold of performing, recording and spreading the word. A large networked and self-aware shadow music industry could be set up. And by the mid eighties, it was widely called indie. So uh, from independent. Um, Today, this is happening as its latest phase in an ongoing process of technological musical empowerment with the vast migration of independent music online, much of it at the hands of a generation that can hardly remember a time before Web 2.0. Web 2.0 is, of course, the social, social web for user-generated content. Um, the modern disconsolate teenager, punk, if you like, has powers of production and distribution that her 1970s counterpart could hardly dream of conceivably reaching an audience of billions with tools that would make the top studio engineers of 30 years ago weep. Um, so there's sort of uh, what Adam Harper's talking about is like free music software and this kind of thing, and then social media tools for promotion. Um, but a lot of the music that he's looking at in this article is stuff like um, PC music artists and um, Vaporwave. And he's also talking about the aesthetics in an interesting way. Um, because, uh, of course, punk is known for its like lo-fi aesthetic, and that's very much an artifact of the technology that was used to make it, um, and also the nature of, you know, you're not a very good guitarist, or you can't really sing. Um, but nowadays, uh, you can sort of make quite high sheen music, and, uh, you know, stuff doesn't really sound like it has tape hiss anymore when you're recording it online. So the, the, te the technology has sort of um, cha changed the role of aesthetics, uh, ch changed the nature of the aesthetics, um, but the actual sort of independence of it um, with a lot of you know, musical subcultures nowadays where kids are making like quite high sheen, glossy um, music, but being able to make it really easily and cheaply at home, that hasn't changed. So there's this in there was this interesting time and I think it's changed now, I don't know. Um, I don't think these discussions really seem to be happening anymore, but at that time in the early 2010s, there was this real backlash to underground artists, um, such as, I mean, at the time, PC Music, now they're very big and working with big mainstream artists. But at the time, it sort of was, it was like a little small scene in London um, and, and sort of music like Vaporwave and stuff. This sort of like small musical underground got a real backlash from the elders, like Gen Xs. And I think it's sort of grounded in a bit of a, an aesthetic debate as well, because after years of decades of punk, this sort of sound of sound, um, sort of lo-fi music uh, and lo-fi aesthetics in general and stuff that sounded like it was handmade, sort of became a bit of a, a semiotic, uh, like a signifier of independence, of not being like recording in a major record label studio and of authenticity. So uh, it is some of the ways that technology has affected aesthetics. Um, so. Ba, 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 ba. Yeah, cool. So um, now I want to take it back to AQMB. Um, and I want to sort of talk a little bit about um, uh, distribution. 
and uh, how the distribution has maybe affected the ways in which we work. Um, so as, as uh, mentioned earlier, like our bread and butter and what we were is, is kind of a, a website as like an independent website. It's just, you know, it's, it's run by us. No one's going to pull it down and you visit the website and get our content. Um, but of course we have, as everyone does, social accounts, um, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, we have a SoundCloud. And I think gradually uh, over time, AQMB has sort of gone from being this destination website to kind of being distributed, um, uh, a series of distributed audiences across different social platforms. Um, so, uh, in a way, I mean, I could sort of think pessimistically that um, these these platforms have kind of captured AQ and B in some kind of ways, uh, and this is something that I want to sort of talk about now and give a bit of a theoretical grounding on um, how, uh, yeah, how, how this how this might have happened, because uh, it of course wasn't the the um, intention, but I would say like self reflectively and and critically, um, you could think that maybe, and I don't know if people um you know here have different sort of ideas of what aqmb is but certainly there's a lot of people out there that might just think aqmb is an instagram page that shares certain um visual artworks or aqmb is a soundcloud account that shares um you know music like we we um uh, share on soundcloud but without even knowing that there's a website where we're writing about this stuff as well um and so, yeah, and also in, in, in that, we're kind of following the logic of these, these certain platforms as well, which is a different thing. You know, there's this thing of like playing to the algorithm a little bit and starting to post, um, you know, it's not something we're doing anymore, but uh, starting to post uh, in terms of like what's going what's gonna to sort of work to the traction of the platform. Um, so... Uh, obviously, a lot has happened since in digital publishing. So, uh, you know, you, you sort of look at like this magazine that I was talking about before, uh, no longer around as a magazine. They stopped years ago and moved into being like a um, a video streaming service, like a like a Netflix for Netflix for art kind of thing. Um, uh, platforms like Fact Magazine, the big music magazine, no longer publishes reviews and and or you know features like they used to and they, they sort of got rid of all their, their music writers and instead turned into this, um, what they are now is producing a lot of video content and this kind of thing. Um, you know, this, uh, and also, you know, the blog like Tiny Mixtapes is over. A lot of these things are sort of due to the way in which um, social media platforms are kind of disrupting and evolving um, independent um, independent media. So I want to sort of give some theoretical tools for this now. Um, first of all, I want to just play a quick little clip uh, of uh, Mackenzie Walk and just discussing her terms, um, Victorialist, Victorialist class and hacker class. These are terms that she was writing about. Um, uh, I guess they were, they were first published, I think, in it. Oh, no, maybe in, in books earlier, but really sort of established in a book from 20, 2004. Um, called the Hacker Manifesto. So that's quite a while ago. And actually before we have the sort of social media age that we have now, I think maybe at that time, probably MySpace was just starting up or whatever, but it was very much sort of early web 2.0, but pre web 2.0 and very sort of prescient now, um, some of these terms. So I'll just have a play of this. What if those who uh, produce information, are not workers, I call them hackers, and it's a word that maybe I uh, didn't date that well, so call it what you like, but let's think of different ways of describing what it means to be someone who produces information but doesn't own or control it, because that's what most people I know do in a metropolitan city, yeah, that's what most labour is that isn't maintenance and service work. So well, then who ends up owning and controlling all that information? So I, I called that ruling class, the vectorless class, in the sense that it's ownership and control of the vector of information. It's storage, it's logistics, uh, it's brands, it's copyrights. Uh, 
you don't need to own the means of production anymore to be a ruling class. And that strikes me as really quite particular. A vector is just a line of fixed length, but any position at all. So it has this sense of a technical specificity that you can deploy in lots of different ways. So that struck me as sort of a useful metaphor for thinking about how you can control a specific thing, but then thread any resources on the planet anywhere together through logistical chains of information. So Apple Corporation doesn't make phones, like it doesn't. You, like that's all made by outsourced to firms elsewhere. So what does it mean to be able to control through the vector the whole value chain? That seems to me to be the question to ask. One of um, yeah, cool, I'll stop it there. Uh, yeah, so really interesting what she's talking about is, um, you know, unlike the old of industrialization, the old capitalist class um, that would own factories, instead, you know, it's just controlling the means of communication is sort of the sort of ruling class of today. And I find it really interesting. Of course, you know, the best sort of example um, that could be given now of, of this idea is, is like social media um, and Web 2.0 and, um, you know, platforms like Instagram, you know, uh, I guess, you know, in the early, you know, in, in the early mid noughts, um, you could say, there was a bit of a like a primitive accumulation of people's friendships and social networks and into this, um, you know, and also and also like subcultural participation. And, you know, as we're sort of seeing in, in, in my sort of discussions about how music and, and art have sort of moved on to these things, this was all sort of hoarded up. And now, um, yeah, these the, all this communication and all these discussions take place via these sort of platforms. Um, and there's no other no other way they've sort of been kind of siphoned through these platforms um, so yeah uh, you know it's kind of an interesting thing that you know you could say that maybe Apple and 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 these sorts of companies don't really care what you're saying just so long as you're using their platforms to say it um, so yeah another thing I mean maybe interesting on this when we're talking a little bit about subcultures and punk and stuff um, and just this kind of uh, sort of trajectory towards this is how um actually maybe I'll, I'll I'll sort of get to this in a slide in a couple of time in a couple of bits time actually I think it will be more relevant to talk about because I wanted to introduce this idea as well um another idea by um Tiziana Terranova a really interesting media theorist again very early like 2004 but was probably writing this in um the late 90s and uh so again very prescient um this idea of free labor and this, this, by this idea, she's um, talking about some of the ways in which um, in digital culture and, and in, the, in the internet and stuff, um, yeah, we have exactly as it sounds, free labor. The good example that she gives is of um, AOL, um, America Online chat boards that she was looking at in the 90s. AOL was a big internet service provider. Um, you know, it was one of the big internet companies of the 90s. I think it's still around. But um, on when that when it first emerged, um, there were chat forums that people could make through AOL, and everyone thought it was great. You know, because you can you have this free chat um, chat board that you can build and you can build for your interests. It, it's kind of like Reddit, I guess, um, and you know, sort of share with your friends. And Tiziana Terranova was looking at this and being like, actually, you know, essentially all these people that are developing these chat boards are working for free for AOL. Uh, this is an idea that's sort of like very much in our consciousness now, how us sort of communicating with our friends on Facebook and whatever, or Instagram or whatever, any of these platforms uh, are sort of just a means for these companies to extract value from us for, through advertising and whatnot. But at the time, it was kind of like not on anyone's minds. Everyone just thought this was a great free tool um, to be used. And Mackenzie Walk says it a bit in her book that, you know, if 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 you're not paying you are the product <laughs> um, kind of thing. So that's sort of very much in this idea, which this term free labor uh, in turn, um, Tiziana Terranova developed from a very interesting text called Immaterial Labor, um, which is earlier still in the, in the mid nineties. Um, I'll just read this out. Uh, immaterial labor refers to directly to the changes taking place in workers' labor processes in big companies in the industrial and tertiary sectors where the skills involved in direct labor are increasingly skills involving cybernetics and computer control. On the other hand, immaterial labor involves a series of activities that are not normally recognized as quote unquote work. 
In other words, the kinds of activities involved in defining and fixing cultural and artistic standards, uh, fashions, tastes, consumer norms, and more strategically public opinion. So these are very much the, uh, I guess, immaterial labor is this sort of blurring of leisure and labor uh, in a way. And these, these sort of things that um, he's mentioning that are not normally recognized as work could very much be, you know, participating in subcultures of, you know, underground music online and, and contemporary art and these sorts of things and posting, um, having an art blog. And yeah, what the point that I wanted to raise a little bit earlier is what's quite interesting as well, you know, um, Maurizio Lazzarato has this, um, this uh, ex expression that I quite like is that the new slogan of Western societies is that we should all become subjects. And I think, um, you know, it's not very much uh, a sort of, uh, it's sort of a, almost an old, becoming an old hat sort of idea that now we are sort of being very much forced to express ourselves online, constantly share, constantly post. Um, this is a really interesting trajectory um, if we think back to talking about punk, because what punk was initially about was this sort of um, uh, response as well. As I said, it's, it was in one hand sort of about the ability to sort of produce, become producers and and uh, like the way in which technology has enabled this a little bit more. But it's also about um, a very sort of specific um, directed reaction against mass culture um, that sort of come, came out of this sort of um, the late 1960s and, you know, the, the May 1968 movement and these sorts of things. The Situationists did inspire the punk movement in the 70s. Um, it was a very specific movement of um, sort of not wanting to be a part of uh, the post-war um, conformist culture of, you know, you have a, a wife and kids and get a car and, and get a nine to five job. Um, interestingly enough, you know, the counterculture of the, the, the 60s, the hippies was much the same, um, even though punks and hippies sort of notoriously hate each other. Um, what sort of interestingly became after this uh, where there was a sort of, you know, sort of general cultural ideology of um, conformity. Um, it's, it's sort of the cliche of the 1950s conformist culture. What sort of ended up becoming the new ideology was a sort of um, expressive individualism. Um, this real sort of desire to express yourself. And it's sort of famously been written about, um, you know, about how kind of 90s Silicon Valley culture sort of took from the hippies and the punks and stuff as this sort of like, um, you know, becoming subjects in, you know, in being an individual and expressing yourself is sort of the new ideology. Um, and so it's this interesting trajectory how, you know, what was sort of a reaction has now become captured into being the new dogma in a way and sort of causing us much grief as we all sort of know from sort of our misery on social media, et cetera. Um, yeah, so, where does this kind of leave us as like an independent publication now? Um, so yeah, in, in, in recent months, um, if people follow AQMB, they'd know that we've um, like in the last, in, in last year, we kind of lost our Instagram account twice, which really sucked because, you know, it puts so much time and effort into it. And Instagram is actually like our biggest audience, a lot, you know, the biggest way to reach people. They sort of go to our Instagram first uh, and it's we're not the only ones that have, like takedowns at the moment seem to be weirdly happening quite a lot, maybe very much, um, I guess, kind of indiscriminately sometimes AI automated bots maybe just see something and then pull a website down for it. Um, but it became a bit of a wake up call for us um, for, you know, how much we've sort of come to be reliant on these platforms. Uh, yeah. And so uh, you know, we're all kind of finding ourselves a little bit at our wits end, um, not just AQMB, but everyone of, of, of like how, how much we're kind of stuck now. Really very much, if you look at the trajectory of, of the publication like AQMB, probably like 10 years ago, as I say, I wasn't involved, but if, if the team could have seen back then, like how much it would have been just so much siphoned into these different kind of, um, centralized platforms uh, that are not owned, you know, because we, we own our website, like, you know, we, we pay the hosting fees and 
no one's going to pull us down. But now, uh, not only is there the risk of kind of takedown with social platforms, but there's also the kind of risk that, you know, Instagram can change its algorithm or do something like change its sort of what it uh, prioritizes on. And, you know, you find yourself sort of trying to play by the rules of, of another platform. Um, so, yeah, we're at this sort of um, turning point now of kind of wondering and it's all a bit of a question mark at the moment for us and I think for a lot of publications, like what happens with our relationship with the social web now, with our relationship, if I can like bring in some of the terms of like with the vectorless class, I think Mackenzie Walk's sort of ideas are very sort of poignant for the times um, because yeah, some of these ideas, um, as we could sort of see as well with like Tiziana Terranova's thinking, they're kind of becoming mainstream thinking at the moment and everyone kind of wants to sort of have the next, but I don't think we really know what that is yet. Um, so some ideas, uh, I guess it can sort of, you know, you have web web one or the, you know, the beginning of the internet, um, which was very much focused on, uh, you know, your internet browser and you go to a web page and you read the information on the page or click a link and go to the next page and receive it. Web two was about this moving towards user generated content and producing content yourself and putting it on the internet, sorry, the social web. Um, and that moves us now to, and but that's sort of come with its, its big issues as we've discussed. And that's kind of moved now into um, these ideas of web three, which, um, which is sort of centered around an idea of decentralization, um, but specifically using blockchain technology um, I'm not going to go too much into detail of it because I'm also not much of a like blockchain technology expert myself. But in short, I mean, and I'm certainly not a finance expert as well. Um, and but I think that is important in that the idea of blockchain essentially kind of came out of a, a, a sort of a finance idea of how do you sort of have a transaction between two parties and eliminate without needing a sort of trusted third party. Um, you know, so this is where the idea, this term trustless on um, blockchain um, comes. So, yeah, essentially it's a distributed, um, decentralized digital ledger that just marks transactions. And the way sort of why it's sort of coming up a bit in these discussions of like moving off of Web2 for, I mean, I guess things like us for, for like for independent publications as well, are so reliant on social media is everyone is kind of looking for a way to remove that um uh untrusted third party really of um the big social media giants and the platforms and sort of um i like this term platform risk that was uh i don't know if it's his own but matt dryhurst mentioned it in a discussion matt dryhurst is a, a musician and, and technologist and um collaborates with holly herndon as well on the interdependence podcast both musicians um and they've started with a couple of other podcasts that some some of you might know, um, New Models and um, Joshua Citarella, who's an artist. Interestingly enough, I mean, this is very much the old like post-internet art crew in a way, like, a little bit like Daniel Keller of New Models was involved in AIDS 3D, very much a sort of post-internet um, big art collective. And um, likewise, Joshua Citarella. Um, anyhow, um, they have started a, a initiative called Channel, which maybe I'll talk about a little bit um, from what I've sort of seen of it. But um, Matt Dryhurst's term platform risk, I think is a really nice one um, because that's basically describing um, the predicament they've found themselves in with relying on um, Patreon, the sub subscriber platform. What happens if Patreon uh, Patreon is a platform that you might be familiar with where you, where you can have, um, your audience pay a subscription fee to receive your content. What happens if uh, if Patreon change something, or what happens if Patreon kick us off? You know these kinds of things. We're very dependent on this platform uh, for to re for reach our audience. So that's platform risk. Uh, trying to find a means of sort of getting off of that. The one that they've devised, as far as I can tell, um, I don't know an awful lot as yet, um, but it's sort of using a kind of means of like a. Uh, basically i guess people buying little um nft token that they can keep in their wallet that sort of um means that they uh, are sort of authenticated as being a subscriber and that means that 
that's not going to get kicked off of any other platform, you know, um, that, that's going to stay with them. Uh, so that, yeah, that, that's, that's a brief little, uh, a little synopsis of that. It's sorry, it was a bit inadequate, but um, I want to sort of just maybe just briefly end this by saying that um, by kind of talking about kind of Web3 and just I wanted to introduce a, uh, another one more little like media theory concept into this as we're sort of, I mean, I guess I'm kind of ending this talk with a bit of question marks because I don't really know what's coming next with this sort of issues that we find with platforms and independent publishing. But um, I'm a bit of a like blockchain um, Web3 agnostic um, and I have my kind of concerns I have the sort of cliche one of the financialization side, but I won't even go into that. But one where I wanted to sort of introduce is just like a final little like bit of media theory thinking to sort of apply as we kind of move into these sort of new, new kind of ideas of platforms um, is remediation. Um, this is an interesting term that is um, was coined by J. David Bolter and Richard Grusin. Um, and basically remediation uh, in their in their thinking, there's no kind of media, no kind of new media is ever really new. We always apply a kind of thinking from the old media onto the new media. So I guess if we could give like a really old example, if you think of like, um, I don't know if people know from the 19th century, the Nickelodeons, where you put a coin in an arcade cabinet and you look through a hole and there'd be a little movie playing. It would be sometimes I think flipbook animation, very early cinema, like pre-cinema screen, um, a lot of those films that you'd watch to the peak, peak hole are kind of, um, they would sort of simulate um, like looking through a keyhole um, of someone getting, you know, they were peep shows, like literally that's where the term comes from. You know, you're looking through a keyhole and someone's getting dressed or something that you shouldn't be watching. But that's an example of this kind of re how we kind of understand one form of media, the media being a keyhole and apply that understanding and way of using that media onto a new form of media being the, the sort of animated um, uh, Nickelodeon box or even likewise like a window how we kind of engage with the cinema screen has often sort of drawn from the fact that we sort of associate pre-cinema um, this sort of square um, thing as like a window so like rear window the, the Hitchcock film you know really plays on that and that you could sort of see that sort of use of the window sort of being applied to the cinema screen as a, as a sort of means of remediation and one thing with web 3 is there's as I find that it sort of seemed to see that there's a lot of um kind of instances for example where there's these new kind of nft based crowdfunding um platforms there's one of which uh, I'm going to name directly called Mira that people, that if, when I saw Mira, I was like, oh, this is a platform for writers to get well-funded for their work. This is great. I'm a writer. I never get paid enough. I really want to sort of look at way into this. And immediately I saw that you needed to have a Twitter account um, to sort of join. And you'd see that the projects that sort of really got off the ground were ones that sort of had established Twitter followings already. So this is kind of just porting over a kind of quantitative follower logic of Web two into a Web three space. It's kind of, in a sense, a little bit of a form of remediation. And I sort of think, what well, you know, what kind of other ideas are we gonna, you know, find ourselves or find others bringing into the Web three space that we wanted to leave behind? Another thing is, if you look into these kind of websites, a lot of crypto websites use terms like founders um, and uh, onboarding, which are very much like um, corporate Silicon Valley speak and it's like if we're trying to get away from that why we're we using their language um, again it's sort of uh, you know it's this kind of thing of like meet the new boss same as the old boss um, that's that's the concern that I have um, so yeah where does that leave us and just to kind of finish um, where does it leave us it leaves us with a big question mark um, so I'll just sort of wrap this back into sort of the concrete where it can be is at the moment um, as you may know, if you've been following us recently, we're not kind of um, publishing so much on, um, or posting rather so much on Instagram. We're rather trying to move ourselves into different platforms. We're looking at ways of sort of being a bit more kind of project oriented, but really looking at ways and how we can sort of make sure that we don't 
sort of find ourselves building this audience for a platform like Instagram and rather having like a good community engagement. So we've moved on to Discord um, in the last couple of months, which is a slow thing that we're building. And we're really trying to also push our kind of Patreon, which is the subscriber based platform uh, and as a kind of a way to um, yeah, kind of engage a little bit more closely with our audiences and, and sort of bring back the kind of community uh, feeling to it a little bit. Um, but where it sort of leaves us in terms of like our relationship and, and independent publishing's relationship with the, the, the sort of space of social media platforms and the vectoralist class, um, it remains a bit of a question mark at this point. But yeah, I'm happy if anyone has any questions or anything that I've sort of glossed over too much or things that they want to know in more detail about a QMB. Thank you. Uh, Joe, thank you too for your talk. Uh, yes, please uh, feel free to ask directly or just write your question to the chat and uh, later on I will speak it loud. Uh, maybe I will start with the Discord. I think it's like understandable like why you wants to move to Discord while it's offer like much more dynamic and direct space for communication and, and like interaction with the uh let's say fan base but uh if I understood it correctly uh Discord will be available only for the Patreon subscribers or so and you yeah. are not you are not con uh, concerned that the paywall will lure away some of the viewers or that you will lose the, let's say, opinion forming role in the field of publishing digital art? So um, basically, the Discord is not ever going to um, overtake our, our website as our bread and uh, I keep saying bread and butter, but it's more as our like core focus. And um, the situation that we found ourselves in is um, we need to have some kind of revenue making for actually paying the cost of the website, like the hosting and all that and all of that. Um, and so that's why we sort of pushed our Patreon and the Discord as a kind of like way of for a, a kind of core audience that want to like give a little bit more and sort of be in on the Discord. But um, I should just be very clear that we're not, not moving our um, actual you know, the content of AQMB all onto Discord. The Discord is more of a space for like a, a small core that want to sort of have a kind of direct line of communication with us a little bit. And also just a way for us to get to really know like our uh, real core audiences as well. Um, there's been a lot of anonymity in AQMB in past. So the Discord kind of is a space for that. But yeah, it would be, it would, it wouldn't really serve our goals as like where we publish you know, because that, that we're trying to get it out to as big an audience as possible. And, and that remains our website. And we do still use Instagram for that reason. Um, we use Instagram to sort of communicate our, our message, which is what it was always there for, is to like share the stuff that we're posting on our website um, and get it out there to as many people as possible, um, which we continue. We'll, we'll always do that for free. We're not making the website itself ever paywalled. Um, but yeah, the Instagram... Um, sort of, as you can probably imagine, started to become a thing in and of itself of like a site to publish documentation outside of our website that ended up taking up a lot of our sort of time and capacity. Um, that's something we want to move away from. But yeah, we're not like paywalling AQMB in terms of like the actual core of it, which is the publication itself. Discord is just like this way of like a little community of um, sort of core members that want to engage with us in an interesting way. Uh, and do you think it's uh, actually like, no other is possible to leave Instagram and still stay visible? Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, I've always been skeptical of Instagram for this reason, because like I've seen through a number of like who uses Facebook anymore and these kinds of things, you know, platforms die and their audiences die out with them. And that's why it's always a bit of a risk. This is like something of this like platform risk is that you you put so much effort into a certain platform and then the next platform comes along. And so what we all find ourselves doing, which is not something that we've sort of got any solutions for, it's something that we still participate in, is like you need to kind of be across all these different platforms in order that one might die and then the next one comes up. 
Um, so yeah, there is a risk of like losing your visibility if you disappear off Instagram. And that's why we've not disappeared off Instagram. Like we're not shutting down our account or anything and we're still using that as our core audiences. But at the same time, it's like, uh, I'm sort of person, and I'm just speaking for me personally and, and not for a can be as an organization, but like I'm of the mind that it's like, if you have a small audience of like a thousand people that really engage with you and they like go on your website and know what AQMB is actually about. Like what's, what's the other like 30 something thousand on Instagram that don't maybe don't even know that AQMB is a website, just kind of know it as, as this like thing on the feed. You know what I mean? Um, that's why I think these platforms don't really serve our purpose in the way that we want them to. Um, and yeah, while there's a risk of losing your visibility, um, we sort of also need to weigh up like, you might lose that visibility anyway in the end and inevitably when they pull you off the platform for no reason and you can't get a hold of anyone at Instagram or, you know, just when platforms kind of die off or they start to become, uh, you know, the audiences shift as well, like audiences shift to different platforms. So, yeah. Uh, actually, I uh, really enjoyed that you used the example of McKinsey work and uh, like these like vertical structures of the uh, uh, internet medias. Because like in the first day of the Ukrainian war, I got an email in the early morning from one of my server providers mm. that was like telling me like. Uh, as soon as possible, make a complete backup of everything that you have on our servers, because we cannot, we don't know if the, the whole service will be not shut down uh, in uh, a type of Russian trolls. Mm -hmm. And that was the moment when I, when I basically like realized, okay, like a lot of years of, of, of my work just are basically like stored somewhere. I don't even know like where physically it is and are pretty fragile. And so what I want to ask, are, are you concerned even to using like the third parties like SoundCloud, et cetera, just like for storing media content that this can be also one day, like it can also one day disappear? Yeah, exactly. Definitely. And it probably will like things like SoundCloud. And, and that's sort of, I think, where a lot of the um, discussions around Web3 come in is a part of, you know, what if that, that's about is about eliminating that risk and having something that's completely decentralized takes away hypothetically that risk of a certain server going down or a certain website shutting down. Um, you know, the technicalities of how that works, I, I don't know. And also um, there's, as, as we've sort of seen, is it's been flaws, a lot, a lot of that kind of um, uncovered with like the NFT thing. And there was big discussions, of course, when how you know, a lot of NFTs in themselves have a shelf life or they're pointed to a certain, you know, the actual artwork in the NFT is pointed to a certain server that could just not be around in 10 years time or whatever. So this whole thing of like digital life, um, I think are things that a lot of people are having sort of discussions about now and ways to kind of work around it. And that's really in the Web3 space, space that I'm not like fully so involved in or know so much yet, but I'm sort of you know, open ears because I think it's going to be important for issues like this that you mentioned. I mean, there's, there is this thing that um, IPFS, interplanetary files storage or file system, uh, yeah, server. And, you know, that's like a, a big distributed server network that people use for their artworks on their NFTs as a way of like future proofing it for um, certain things going down. But yeah, that's the goal of decentralization, I guess, in these Web3 debates is to kind of eliminate that kind of risk. Uh, this brings me to another question. So like, uh, what do you feel like, what do you think, what's the proper way of archiving uh, digital content? Yeah, I mean, that's a really hard and, and, and difficult question. I, I don't think it's one that I can fully answer. I mean, you know, other than sort of pointing to maybe interesting projects that have happened around it. Um, you know, uh, I think if you look up some of the stuff that the Rhizome website has done, um, it, I can't really think of it in like the name of it in, in my mind at the moment, but I know they did like a project looking at the archive, archiving of digital art 
networks and you know because it's something new that's sort of come up I mean another thing as well is that like certain old you know early net art and these kinds of things would have existed in order to exist on certain web browsers from the 1990s that don't exist anymore so it's this I mean it's a kind of a conservation question like for art conservationists in some ways um, but then yeah for us as like a as a platform um, one thing I should say is that we are working on a, a physical anthology which is kind of um, funny to think of as like a you know digital first like digitally focused publication but one thing that I really am so keen to get this anthology out for is a way of having this kind of archival um, sense of security ironically even though you know everything's only been published on the internet if you put out a physical book you can then archive that in a library and have it send off copies to the library and know that it's it's stored there and accessible for people for um for retrieval or if the library's archives are getting digitized as well it'll stay there that's something me personally that i'm uh quite keen for aqmb to keep a sort of a record of because there will definitely be a day when our website is just eventually fully broken you know in the future all websites kind of have this this shelf life unfortunately um and yet so it's about like what what kind of remains um and that's hopefully the, the anthology can serve that a little bit but then yeah there's the other question of of conservation of digital artworks which is a whole other whole other um sort of conversation but yeah i mean that you raised that i would like to actually go back and have a look at the rhizome website sort of work in that field again because that's quite interesting uh actually in my case i solve it in uh, burning everything on dvds like oh, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can still buy dvds that can stay 100 years okay like minimum yeah, but uh yeah uh, let, let's go back to the anthology uh while as you mentioned it will be all like a physical thing and uh while like most of the content on aqmb is directly on i directly related uh, to the digital with all its characteristic as you mentioned remediation yeah non-linearity uh remix hyperlinks i don't know ar etc uh the physical publication certain like limitations that are like linked to the physicality of the medium itself yeah. uh, <laughs> what uh, was or what are the biggest limitation in the process of preparing such uh anthology well or yeah do you i'm sorry uh, just to like uh, follow with another question or uh did you hit like some point when you like realized that like okay uh this is possible only in digital yeah well obviously um yeah the anthology will be will sort of work to the medium of being a book and like we've kind of been working about like how do we tell the story of aqmb and through some of the key articles that it's been posted in but it can't sort of work as a, a fully archival document that sort of captures everything of course um yeah so we're kind of really working to the book medium of it being kind of text based but also our kind of thinking, and we don't really know how this will pan out yet, um, but of ways that we can kind of incorporate some of the stuff that is online. I mean, the big thing, of course, is the sound premieres and, and these sorts of things, like the audiovisual content, that's such a big part of what we do. And yeah, that can only really exist digitally. So how do you do that in a way that's also archival is, is still a bit of a question mark. We've thought about like, you know, QR code link kind of ideas and these sorts of things, maybe, um, yeah, I don't know whether they'll follow in, but this is why me personally, I'm interested in these sort of different um, decentralized server things now, like the the IPFS and maybe that sort of thing can play into the role of it. But for the context of our anthology, I think we're going to sort of play to the medium of the book. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> it's, it's springtime here, so the hay fever is bad. Yeah. And you already know when it will be published? Uh, no, not at this point. I mean, we're hoping to kind of have um, pre-orders for it, like out by the end of the year. But it's quite a it's quite an undertaking that we sort of take on. You know, um, you know, AKMB is you know largely a sort of volunteer run operation. All the sort of day to day that we do with the site is all volunteers. So we're all kind of working other jobs, um, <laughs> and so like a book of like ten years 
of, of content is is a is a big undertaking but yeah we really want to get it out like um at least for some sort of orders um by the end of the year i have some kind of news of it taking shape by then um because sort of in line with our 10-year anniversary and uh i will like to point back to the nft uh are you aware of the ecological footprint of like the the NFT itself, like the way the the way how it's encrypted, uh, consume like so big amount of energy that is uh, similar to the energy spend of countries like Argentina? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Um, and then, uh, yeah, there's this is where my sort of knowledge of the technology sort of finds me in a spot where I can't argue for or against these things i mean yeah i'm as i say also very crypto agnostic um maybe graduated from being a grumpy crypto skeptic and hating all of this crap to like sort of being open ears about it <laughs> and sort of at least letting people sort of um educate me um but yeah i guess the um the big thing that maybe the sort of arguments that people would say to kind of counter that is the way in which um a lot of these blockchains now i think are moving to a different um method um you know this sort of proof of stake i think it is but rather than proof of work um not going to get into the technicalities of it because i can't <laughs> but they are moving towards more like and some of them you know new chains that i think ethereum itself will eventually migrate onto a less energy intensive blockchain is that is what they say again i'm not this is not a defense because i don't know um and a lot of other there's other blockchains that are less energy intensive bitcoin will always be extremely energy intensive um but that's not what's used for the nfts and these sorts of things the ones that are used for nfts are ones that have like smart contracts built into it so that's like ethereum and i mean yeah others are moving into different kind of less energy intensive ways but again it's not a for me it's not i can't defend or or attack crypto in this in this way because i'm just not familiar with the technology enough uh yeah thank you and uh as you mentioned in the beginning like uh you were following aqmb from 2014 if i'm right yeah. uh yeah so we have like eight years called you uh or in your opinion uh, what do you think were the biggest gaps uh in the way how the digital culture is produced within the time you are following a can be or being a member the the biggest gaps sorry how do you mean um, uh like the uh changes in the style let's say or in in the way of, of production sure yeah i mean i i think um it's this kind of trajectory, you know, my, maybe my biggest sort of dissatisfaction is sort of seeing how, uh, you know, things really got siphoned into not only, um, not only just using, um, so, you know, these third party or social media platforms, but the way those platforms really started to dictate the way in which you produce, um, you know, producing for the platforms, starting to use the logic of the platforms, um, you know, in, in the sense of AQMB, um, you know, I could say that, uh, you know, really our core is, is our, con you know, our content that we produce, like our articles and our, um, you know, our sound premieres and these sorts of things. But um, Instagram doesn't care about that. Instagram wants you to post certain kinds of images that will get certain kinds of traction and whatever. Um, so the logic of um, the these platforms really started to dictate and become curatorial in a way. And that's sort of something I wanted to say that I didn't mention at my um, at the end of my talk is that um, you know what is the purpose of an independent publishing platform like AQMB now? Like why do we need to exist when there's so many you know people can individually follow um, the artists that they like, or artists can reach audiences themselves on um, social media and whatnot. But I think that that's um, really to our detriment is we still really want kind of uh, a sort of a curatorial element to these things. 
and we don't want to really want to be sort of existing in this world of like everyone's an island that goes and sort of broadcasts to the world because you know how as we've seen just the technicalities of how that works is it starts to there is always a, a sort of um a sense of aggregation or a curatorial element but it becomes the algorithm that starts to kind of become the curatorial voice um based on a, a sort of an inhuman logic of this sort of aggregation um you know it sounds very corny it's like we need the human touch whatever but um yeah i think there's still very much need for like independent publishers and uh independent platforms and independent sort of curators that can sort of pull different trends and practices together and broadcast it out and not let it get captured by algorithms etc really thank you for this answer uh th th there are enough uh, more questions so i think we can we can finish with this point like with no the with the need of have the human actors in the process of creating uh so jared thank you one more time a lot for your time and for being with us here tonight uh for your talk and for the presentation and uh wish you and the aqnb all the best thank you very much and thank you so much for having me hopefully see you in the flash in the future <laughs> i hope so thanks all thank you ciao ciao bye